Coming up on Access Tech Live. Apple makes podcasts more accessible. The state of audiobooks in 2024. And we introduce you to AxCon, an online digital accessibility conference. This is Access Tech Live with Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. The latest in tech and accessibility every week. Follow us now and get involved at Access Tech Live. Hey everybody, welcome to our week of Access Tech Live. I am Stephen Scott, and as always, by my side, as he is every week, Mark Aflalo, but uh, you're not in uh, Montreal this week. Where are you, Mark? Uh, you know what? I managed to turn the transporter on uh, over the weekend. Uh, I honestly don't know where I am. No, I'm in the studios, uh, AMI, in Toronto. Uh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful studios. They've customized all this, Stephen, just for my appearance here. People are going crazy behind the scenes. You don't hear it. But uh, let, let me thank them now before everything goes to hell. Yeah, well, I was going to say it's more to do with what you're asking for. I think your rider is the biggest problem here, right? Because you're asking for all these specialty teas and coffees and pastries and all this stuff. Have they managed to, to satisfy all of your needs? I'm still waiting for the green Skittles, but I'm sure they're coming <laughs> any time now. Yeah, excellent. I have to say, though, just a little bit behind the scenes for you. I call Mark this morning just saying, hey, how are you doing? And he's like, hey, I'm with this person from AMI and that person from AMI. And I'm thinking, wow, has everyone gone to Montreal? Stephen's jealous. Today? Completely Stephen's forgetting jealous. where you are. <laughs> I've completely forgot where you are. But you're in Toronto today, and I am very jealous, absolutely. Uh, and hey, you're not alone, because coming into studio today uh, to talk all things audiobooks is uh, Ramia Amnuthan, of course, from Kelly and Ramia. Uh, also a uh, host of the uh, audiobook review on AMI. And uh, joining us a bit later as well, Jacob Shemansky from AMI Audiobook Review, joining us as uh, it will be uh, one of the people from uh, AxCon, a conference that is coming up. Ryan Bateman is going to be joining us to tell us all about a fantastic conference that is uh, coming up uh, this month, in fact. So we're going to get into all that on the show this week. But first, let's kick things off with the headlines. Now, Access Tech Live headlines. Yes, who's in the news again? Apple is making major accessibility headlines with a change to its podcast service. Apple Podcast is introducing a new transcription feature that will allow everyone to read and even search through transcripts of podcasts on its platform. Starting with iOS 17.4, transcripts will automatically be transcribed by AI, while giving podcasters the option to replace that with a corrected version of their own if they need to afterwards. Now, the back catalog of podcasts, because there are many, will be transcribed over a period of time, so it's not going to be there right away. You'll have to wait a little bit to find out. And of course, that'll only you know work with new episodes from now going forward when you start uploading them for 17.4. The Ontario government is making major plan accessibility. The company's transportation and planning agency, Metrolinx, manages transportation planning for the greater Toronto and Hamilton area, and it's partnering with Access Now to pinpoint the accessibility status of locations on the GO Transit system. Now, Access Now will work with Metrolinx to map the accessibility of the stations, bus terminals, and train cars, all while offering feedback on areas that they need to improve. Obviously, the goal of the partnership is to make the entire GO Transit system, system fully accessible by 2025. Elon Musk company Neuralink has made a huge breakthrough. They've finally and successfully implanted a brain chip in a real human patient for the first time. No monkeys here. The chip is designed to help people with brain and spinal injuries. It records brain activity and sends that information to a computer, which translates the signals into movements. This means individuals that have a paralysis could potentially control a computer or robotic arm. Just imagine the capabilities. The surgery was, was a success and the patient is doing very well. This is a major step forward and a breakthrough in the field of brain computer interfaces <clears throat> and could improve the lives of so many people. Now, Stephen, the Winter Adaptive Games at Queen's University are helping people with disabilities participate in winter sports. The games include adaptive equipment and trained volunteers to help people with disabilities enjoy the winter season. It's a great opportunity for people with disabilities to get active and, of course, have fun in the snow at the same time. Finally, the Accessible Assistive Technology Industry Conference. I'll get it out. I promise I will. I uh, just wrapped up in Orlando. <laughs> and one company is making headlines thanks to uh, AI that can actually see, and I say see in quotes, video content. The company's called Audible Sight, and they've announced the launch of its new software as a service that can watch video and add description to it in real time. It analyzes the video and generates simple text descriptions that can then be verbalized by text-to-speech. This is the first time that audio description 
and for video has been accomplished using AI. Very cool stuff coming out of that conference, Stephen. It's been on my list for next year. I'm gonna try and get to Orlando and actually see all the cool technology. Of course, it's right after CES, right? They don't waste any time bringing up the excessive tech. Yeah, and you know, you, you think about this, you think about ATIA, you think about Site Tech Global. There are so many great conferences happening. CSUN happening a bit later this year as well. And all of these conferences are getting higher and higher profiles. I have to say a lot of it, I think, is down to AI because there is so much interest in the world of AI. But this story in particular is fascinating because I thought we wouldn't see this until, say, perhaps ChatGPT 5 or 6 when it could actually be able to identify live video and th at that point, perhaps it could work on audio description. I wonder how it works though, Mark. Is this some kind of system that is perhaps just grabbing images and it's grabbing those images and then just analyzing them very quickly and turning that around and, and drawing description from it? I wish I had the answer to that question, but I've actually reached out to Audible site to try and get the answer and have them on a show to explain just that because I'm as, as curious as you are. This is just, as you said, something I expected maybe in a year from now, but the speed at which AI is progressing is absolutely insane and it ties in perfectly to what we're going to be talking about today, which is audiobooks. That's right. Uh, also, quick mention on the Neur Neuralink story, of course. Elon Musk in the headlines here. And, you know, it's, it's such an interesting... Um, watching social media with this story, <laughs> we tend to see people immediately fall negative on this side of this particular story. Because even though the technology sounds incredible, even though the advancements sound incredible, I do wonder if Elon Musk's name next to this story creates an impact, a negative impact. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to argue the, the, both the positivity that Elon Musk has brought to the table in all of technology and, of course, the negativity that comes with it, just because of the person he is and the way in which he approaches things. That mm -hmm. being said, you got to choose a side, right? Choose to look at the positive. It's just like AI. Choose to look at the negative things that you could do with it, or let's focus on the positive. I think in terms of Neuralink, take Elon Musk out of the equation, which he does himself. He does a very good job at saying, I'm not the president of this company. Let them do their thing. And they have accomplished so much. That's also because of the money and the funding that he brings to the table. So you pick mm. a side and go with it. On social media, they're going to pick a side that just, just riles people up. Well, hey, listen, one thing we can all agree on is that audiobooks are a good thing, right? And we're going to talk a lot about audiobooks today. In fact, it's our question of the day. The question is, what makes a good audiobook? That is a great question. What makes a good audiobook? And I think what I'm thinking about here is, you know, for me as someone who is consuming more books now in different formats in ways that I've never done before and having access to more books than ever before, it is such a great time to get into books. But that is a great question. What makes a good audiobook. Mark, people can get in touch in all the usual ways, right? Oh, yeah. They can follow us on all social media. It is at Access Tech Live. They can give us their feedback, whether good or bad. Let us know what makes an audiobook good for you. Of course, you can email us, feedback at accesstechlive.com, and reach out. We're going to get to your answers later on in the show and find out from our panelists next what they think as well. Because coming up after a break, we're going to dive straight into audiobooks and ask that forbidden question later on. Are AI voices good enough? in 2024. Stick around. There's more Access Tech Live to come. Get involved and have your say at Access Tech Live on social media. We'll be right back. Now, back to Access Tech Live, the latest in tech and accessibility with Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. And we're back on Access Tech Live. I'm Stephen Scott. Marco Flalo is with me. He is in Toronto this week and uh, in the studios at uh, AMI HQ. And Mark, you're not alone. No, I'm not. We figured, you know, I'm in Toronto. Why not bring in some people who are in Toronto as well? And one of those people is Ramya Amuthan, who is the co-host of Kelly and Ramya, of course, uh, weekday afternoons on AMI-TV. And she's also the reason, the real reason she's here, obviously not because she's a big star there, uh, but because she's the co-host of the Audiobook Review, an incredible AMI original podcast that you can find out all your podcast providers, Stephen, and someone else is joining us. That's right. Uh, you're not alone either. I'm not alone either because uh, here in the virtual world, uh, I have Jacob Shemansky with me. Uh, he is also co-host of AMI's Audiobook Review. Great to have you along for the ride as well, Jacob. Hey, thanks for having me. Let's do this. Uh, absolutely. Now, uh, Ramia, you know each other, right? You, 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 yeah. you guys, Jacob, you, you've met, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're actually in the same offices right now, right? Jacob, you're at AMI. 
He's hiding in a different yeah, video. I sure am. Just a couple of meters away from you. Okay, cool. Oh, and did, didn't like want to come noticed. in the studio. Okay, that's fine. We'll, I we'll just think leave he that. tried. We'll just park that. We didn't mm. let him. Okay, let's 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 just let's just not go there. Uh, right. So uh, let's talk about audiobooks. Um, Rami, I'll start with you. Tell me your sort of take on audiobooks, the state of audiobooks at the moment, because for me it seems like there are so many, so much more audiobooks available than ever. Is that your? Is that yeah, your of course. This? Yeah, there are so much more audiobooks available than ever before, which is obviously why we're super excited and decided, you know, a weekly pod is the perfect way to continue talking about everything and anything that people want to cover in regards to audiobooks. Like, we're not just saying there are audiobooks out there, go check it out. We're saying, and how do you listen to your audiobooks? And what are your habits around audiobooks? And are you a convert to audiobooks? And are you exclusively audiobooks? Like, literally, the conversations are everywhere and I'm not just having it with people who are uh, blind or have low vision anymore Stephen the the convo is with everybody and anybody the amount of people that we've had on the podcast um, up to now which is in its season three like 125 episodes uh, people who are cited who just exclusively say they listen only to audiobooks yeah and it's, it's interesting you say that Jacob uh, because Jacob as well I want to bring you on this because I do think about this a lot. I think about you know the the value of audiobooks to people who are blind. It seems obvious, right? I mean, yep. that's kind of where audiobooks came from, right? That's mm -hmm. the, that's how yeah. they were came came to life. But they do, of course, benefit many sighted people. But what about other disabled people? Because there's lots of reasons I think why people may choose audiobooks as a, as a way of enjoying audiobooks. Is that right, Jacob? Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Like it, nowadays, it's unthinkable for authors to put out a book and have it not be available mm -hmm. as an audiobook. And when it comes to people with other disabilities, yeah, absolutely. There's all sorts of cognitive disabilities that would make it very difficult to just hold a traditional, um, just to like interpret a book properly and just physical disabilities make it difficult to physically hold a book up for a very long time. Um, and dyslexia, like, sure, you can read for a little bit, but it's very difficult after a while. So, yeah, it goes a long way to be helping out a bunch of people. So my son's doctor, my son has autism, and my son's doctor suggested that he uh, get into audiobooks as a way, because it works the same part of your brain. Yeah. And that's something that I didn't realize, mm -hmm. is that reading a book, um, we always know that everybody says you know, it's important to read books and consume that, but it's working a part of your brain. It's, it's actually helping you. I didn't realize that audiobooks did the exact same thing. And it's cool to see how it's right. being used across it. And not only, you know, as you said, low vision. I'm curious, you know, the the accessibility of it, meaning the access to audiobooks, whether it be on our uh, devices or Stephen, I know you use the Victor, the reader. Um, you know, do you think that has lent to the popularity of them, just because people have more and more ways that they already have, like their phone, to just be able to listen to them? Yeah, I guess it depends how um, lazy you are. I mean, <laughs> Stephen, when you say you have a Victor reader, uh, I'm thinking, damn, an actual device for audiobook listening? That's proper. Um, I was so lazy with my audiobooks that even when CNIB back in the day was sending me physical books, Daisy uh, CDs, discs of books, I was like, but then I have to take it and then put it in my device. And But now, you know, on my smartphone, I just go into Audible or go into Sela, hit download, and it's there. It's in my bookshelf. It's ready to go. Even the speed and the setup is already good for me so i can consume so much more now simply because it's available to me the way i need it and and as quickly as i need it yeah it's funny you say that because i've been uh, talking about this on my double tap show i've got this victor reader stream third generation the very latest guys nice. obviously uh mm. they didn't send it to me by the way i had to buy this with my own wow. money just wow. oh my god i know first piece of tech you bought <laughs> <laughs> do we have a do we have a breaking news thing here, honestly? But you know, it was it was really interesting because I decided to go down this route because I wanted easier access to those books. And what I mean by that is I wanted to be able to, and this is the joy of the Victor Reader, it has physical buttons, it has a physical keypad. So being able to navigate chapters and all of that is much easier. Uh, now, of course, the other benefit of using a device over, say, a smartphone is the ability to not get notifications. I don't have Mark calling me every five minutes yes. on my Victor Reader stream. Wow. The gen, right? It's cool. <laughs> so cool. But, you know, that's the thing, right? Dedicated tech can really make the difference. I want to ask you both a question, though, about reading. I, I, I've had this leveled at me before. Audiobooks is not really reading. I've had this leveled at me a few times. Ramia, your take. Oh, am I going first? I wanted Jacob to go first, <laughs> especially because Mark kind of chimed in on this already, that it works the same part of your brain. Jay. 
<laughs> I think we're arguing semantics at this point. Is it reading? Well, it depends how you define reading. Is reading the act of translating visual print with with your brain using your eyes? Or is it your brain interpreting text, the words on the page? It really depends how you interpret the word reading. But when you're listening to an audiobook, it's important to realize that it's the exact same words that it would be if it was on the page. And in that sense, what's the difference? You're consuming the exact same words. Okay, I disagree very okay. much. Okay. okay, and the reason why is when you're consuming an audiobook, you're consuming a product that has already been translated. Somebody else has read these words and they've performed them out to us and now we're consuming their interpretation of, right? This is, a, you know, being read already and now it's being told to us. It's a, it's kind of I akin it to storytelling, mm. listening to stories, even though that's not the case all the time. Like we're taking in textbooks this way. We're using screen readers on a regular basis. So it is just audio feedback. But, you know, put all that aside for my argument's sake and say we're consuming an already produced product versus when we're reading Braille or visually reading print, there's less between us and the print, less between our cognitive uh, process of these words and the print that's out there. And I think that's why we argue about grammar and, you know, are we understanding language when we take in screen reader or audiobooks? Are we getting in all that stuff? I don't think so, guys. I think it cuts off a, a reasonable percentage um, doing it this way. But there's, but there's, I've heard audiobooks mm. that are just straight read obviously right off the pages verbatim yeah. but I, and i've heard audiobooks that are produced almost like a podcast right so mm. at what point is it a mm. performance versus just a straight representation of a book i mean even if it's minimal it's still a performance like if you're okay. reading the headlines to us versus me going on news and reading the headlines myself i think that there's some difference in interpretation here interesting okay well, yeah. I, I think the word interpretation is a bit of an overstatement probably because it, it, it's still, it's not like they're completely changing the meaning of the words. Right. It's uh, like, what really matters is the words on the page and what they're trying to say. Like, I don't yeah, but, think but I will say, a person yeah. reading out the text is going to change the message all that much. Not the message. I, I would say, I would say, is that though, not I think what there's, matters? There's, there's something about all this, though, which is quite interesting, because I, I, I'm with you on this a little bit more, Rami, if I'm honest, because the, I recently mm -hmm. watched a TV series where there was a book version yep. uh, that I decided to go and listen to. And the book just felt so different and so weird to listen to in comparison to the TV show. Right. Because the TV show, those characters, those voices, they became those, those people became embedded in your mind. And it sounded so different on the other side. Absolutely. And I just thought, this has changed the book for me. This has changed the whole thing. Whereas if I was reading it with my own fingers or reading it with, you know, in another way, if I could read low, uh, large print as a low vision person, then I would certainly, I think, take it in a bit differently. You would add your own character That's to it. it. Yeah. You would bring your own character to it, which I think is what you're suggesting. Yeah, like, you know how we always talk about this, right? We go to TV and they've already made it happen for you. You don't have to use your imagination anymore. They've literally taken mm. the the words and made a visual interpretation of it. And now we're just taking in that, that... um idea of the Harry Potter world or whatever then but then you take it a, one step back and you go listen to Jim Dale or Stephen Fry narrating uh, the audiobook and you can kind of imagine things like the words and the images you got to imagine but this person's already created the character voices for you so the voices that you're hearing are not ones that you've developed in your head about mm. what you think Harry sounds like but actually the way that this person has performed it well, what you see in your mind's eye when you're listening to an audiobook is a lot more than just the voices of the characters. It's true. And the way they're saying out those words. Like, there's the world and the visual way yes. that things are described, right? Like, it's a lot, it's a lot more than just the voices. I guess yeah. it also comes down to the type of content you're consuming, right? Definitely. Because yes, if you're, if you're yeah, listening absolutely. to a business, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk or somebody talking about his business perspective, if it's in his voice and it's just storytelling or just kind of advice, it's different than a story like a mm -hmm. Harry Potter that is completely, you know, a fantasy yeah. world. Mm -hmm. You're almost saying that an audiobook is akin to watching a movie versus reading the book. Close, or like a halfway between. Mm. Um, but also, just to add one more thing in here, if you are reading, let's say, a business textbook or, you know, picking up a, a book that's very, very straight read uh, and straight content, like inform informative, um, I think that 
an audiobook has the power to put you on or put you off a topic, depending on how a person read it, which might not, like, it might not be that impressionable if you pick up the text version of a book and have a screen oh, reader read it. Honestly, to you. Ramya, I am 100% with you on that. There is nothing worse than a terrible narrator. Uh, <laughs> honestly, there are books I have just turned off. <laughs> Because it starts off, in the 1900s, this thing happened. <laughs> yeah. And you think, I just can't deal with yeah, this. I forget can't deal it. with this. You don't know if you'd yeah. ever have liked the book. So I guess we're all, I know, it could be we're, brilliant. We're all agreeing to disagree here on a certain aspect yeah. of it, but that's fine. <laughs> yeah. So let me take the conversation in a different direction. After a break, I'm going to pose a little quiz to everybody here. I'm the only one who knows the answers, so uh, do stick around. Uh, we have a wonderful guest with us, uh, Rami Amuthan and uh, Jacob Shymansky. When we come back, I'm going to put you all to the test and ask you the question whether you think AI voices can replace humans. Stick around. It's Access Tech Live. There's more Access Tech Live to come. Get involved and have your say at Access Tech Live on social media. We'll be right back. Now, back to Access Tech Live, the latest in tech and accessibility with Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Access Tech Live. Now, this week we are talking all about audiobooks and uh, it's a, such an interesting topic, right? Because there's so much you can talk about. Uh, we just had a fantastic debate uh, on the subject of audiobooks. Is it really reading, Mark? That's, that question I think we could do the whole hour on. But uh, we're going to talk about AI, artificial intelligence in audiobooks. And I'm a bit confused here because you seem to have a, a quiz. You, I do. You've created yes, of course. Quiz. Is it's this always... because you've had far too much time in your hotel room? You know, that's what happens when you're stuck in a hotel room for five hours, you forget to eat, you decide, let's do some things. Let's have some fun with some people around here, including you, Stephen. And this is this okay. is what's going to happen here, okay? A very simple question. I'm going to play an audio clip, and you're going to tell me at the end of the audio clip, each of you, you can take your turns, no fighting here, okay? Whether you think this clip is... I can't is, promise that. Ah, whether you think the, the, the clip that you're hearing is AI or it's a human being. I'm not telling you the answers till the very end. So we will start uh, with uh, someone by the name of Grace. Let's hear that sample now. There were doors all around the hall, but they were all locked. And when Alice had been all the way down one side and up the other, trying every door, she walked sadly down the middle, wondering how she was ever to get out again. Okay, so that's Grace. Rame, you're next to me. Uh, do you think that is a human being or do you think that is AI? Someone keep score, please, okay? Okay, I first guess I think it's a human being. Are we okay. allowed to listen twice? We could listen twice again, but Jacob, do you want to hear it again? Yeah, let's hear it again, please. Okay, let's roll Grace again if we can. If you need me to stall, I can do that too. Here we go. There were doors all around the hall, but they were all locked. And when Alice had been all the way down one side and up the other, trying every door... She walked sadly down the middle, wondering how she was ever to get out again. I think I'm hearing a different mic position. I'm going to say human. Okay, so Rami goes human. Uh, Jacob, you are a guest as well. Yeah. You can... I'm hearing the same thing, like a bit of reverb at some points, right. and she seems to have a bit of a, like a southern drawl at points. Mm -hmm. So mm. I'm going to say human, but I'm really scared that I'm wrong. I know. <laughs> so I really don't want to be wrong. Stephen Scott, you do not know the answers. What do you think, human or AI? I, 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 I have no idea of the answers. I think it's AI. Okay. Oh. Okay. So this is oh. fine. Let's move on. Let's move on to Charlotte. Okay. Charlotte has a wonderful sample. By the way, this is all from Alice the Looking Glass, if you haven't oh. figured that out. A nice royalty-free uh, book that we can use. Um, yes. Let's roll Charlotte, <laughs> shall we? Suddenly she came upon a little three-legged table, all made of solid glass. There was nothing on it but a tiny golden key. And Alice's first idea was that this might belong to one of the doors of the hall. But alas, either the locks were too large or the key was too small. But at any rate, it would not open any of them. Hmm. <laughs> it, uh, well, that's a that's tough one. Human. Oh, that's human. human. Okay, Robbie says human. Oh, really? Okay. I think so. Okay, Jacob? I agree. That's a human too. Okay, yeah. Stephen? I see. I'm listening for AI. That's the problem. I'm I listening know. for AI. Oh, oh, I know. Uh, you know I hope, uh, I I hope everybody I'm... is keeping track here because I have no idea what you guys have answered, but so far, okay, human. Uh, okay. In the control room, I'm sure they're wondering. Yeah. Okay. But this one sounds I'm more human, human than the first one. So I'm okay, so we're going with human across the board here. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the last one. I decided to, you know, throw a male in there. This is Adam. Let's listen to Adam right now, everybody. 
There seemed to be no use in waiting by the little door, so she went back to the table, half hoping she might find another key on it, or at any rate a book of rules for shutting people up like telescopes. This time, she found a little bottle on it, which certainly was not here before, said Alice, and tied round the neck of the bottle was a paper label with the words, Drink Me, beautifully printed on it in large letters. Okay. <laughs> okay, so my <laughs> final answers are human, human, AI. Human, human, AI. Okay, Jacob? Yeah, last one is AI, because uh, if this person is a human, then he's the most prolific voiceover artist of all time. <laughs> I, yes. I hear this guy's voice on TikTok breaths, every day. Oh, Do you? Okay. No, it's not I know that, that guy. guy's voice. Okay. It's an AI him. voice. Steven? I know it. It's, it's him. TikTok, it's that guy. Yeah, it's no, not. you're absolutely right. It is 100% it is AI on that one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what you guys think, right? Yeah. Every single one of those was AI. What? Every single I, one of I those. I knew this. I was knew AI. that was going to be the answer. I had no. a feeling this I'm was. Hear, a I'm trap. hearing the laughter of the oh, control room behind super me. Superhuman <laughs> so sounding this is, second this one. Is, this is, you know, a year ago Charlotte. we probably would have said, um, "No way could AI replace a human being and read an audiobook." But you just answered that question um, mm. in that little that little quiz. Stephen, thoughts? <laughs> that that is it does go to show, right? I mean, you, you, we're listening up because when you use a screen reader, you get used to nuances and ways that the yes. robot talks. But it, it goes to show how it is becoming so difficult to tell the difference. Now, over a period of time, I think that would emerge. This is me getting out of it. Uh, you know, I, over a period of time, <laughs> you would pick up on, you know, that wasn't a long enough sample. I mean, if you'd listened to an hour long, right. I would oh, have picked up on, on. There was so no, much it's dimension. True. There's so much That's dimension, true. especially in the yeah. first yeah. one, you could hear them like kind of moving positions and mic yeah. or whatever. Like Breathing, there's breathing yes. in there in certain ones there's, too. There's, yeah. you know, vocal yeah. fry here, but not there. Yeah. There's, ah, no, definitely. No, but Jacob's on my side, guys. Of course, you no know, my way. wife's got every single one of them. She's like AI, AI, AI. I'm like, really? I'm like, I tried to make this as hard as possible. How? And you picked yeah. such different production value too. Yeah, no, I, I, and I went for different excerpts from the book to make Ooh, it different really and make hard. sure they weren't the same. Yeah. And you even listened to that first one twice, and yeah. you still. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Ooh, what so, I want to no, hear. Yeah. What I want to hear is it doing like a dialogue between two fictional characters. Oh. That's a challenge. See, Fine, it's not yeah. gonna, like, yeah, is more, it going to be dynamic. able to imitate, like do voices something more dynamic? Yeah, exactly. Mm. Can it imitate the interesting, emotion, well, interesting. anger, sadness, sarcasm, right. can it do that? It is interesting because that is starting to happen. There is a company at the moment working on this where they're actually building radio drama type productions with these kind oh. of voices and they're adding in all kinds of level of emotion. So, for example, let's say it's a couple in a car, they're having an argument, uh, and, you know, one's getting a little bit louder, one's getting, uh, you know, louder, and it, suddenly it's getting shrieking and all this. They're actually able to bring all that in, literally just on a waveform on a piece of software, just saying, dial up the shrieking or whatever. But, you know, they do it in such a way that it'd be very hard to tell the difference between it and a produced audio drama. Rami, I want to ask you, you know, coming into this, before we listened to those clips, before we found out the answers to that, do you think you would have sat down and listened to a book with AI? And having heard what you've heard, do you change your mind? Would you change your mind? I change my mind about if I like it? <laughs> if you would do if, it, well, you could, could you? Would oh, you I think I could. It? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Uh, I do agree with Jacob, though. Like, if, you know, if you could start telling because it's not doing a good job with different characters or you start thinking, like, eh, mm -hmm. the performance level's meh. Because we're so used to well-produced stuff now, right, Stephen? Like, we're really yeah. not down to settle for anything that doesn't sound good. And it, so, yeah, if, I, mm -hmm. if it doesn't sound good, I'd put it away and say, uh, pick a human. But if it's doing, if it's on par with human performance, then I would 100%. Like, I think that these, just between the three, we heard a lot of dynamic. Jacob, yeah, what do you think? Absolutely. Mm. I'm unconvinced, but for a nonfiction book, uh, I would listen to AI no problem because I think it, it can do a straight read beautifully. It never struggles with a pronunciation and articulation. It's yeah. super intelligible. But for a, a fiction, a fantasy, never. Absolutely not. Really? No, it, Interesting. It needs that human touch. Well, so here's a question because, this, this, uh, yeah. go ahead. See, here's a question is that, you know, AI, we look at AI as this negative thing that could potentially take our jobs. But in the audiobook world, books come out and the audiobook is available and they've put the time into it and they've gone to this great production right. value. So, like, where does AI fit when it comes to audiobooks? Do we need it? Yes, it could save some money here and there, but. I don't think anybody's really racing to try and replace the human red word. On the contrary, oh, no, no, quite they're the hiring opposite. celebrities yeah, quite the there. Yeah, mm, 
I... No, it's quite the opposite, actually, because there are so many books that will never, ever be turned into audio. And that's yes, really exactly. where AI comes into it. So, yeah. so AI gives us the ability to get access to books. I mean, there are so many books I can think of that I would love to read, that, especially local history books, things that will just never be turned into yep. audio. And that being able to happen and using a voice like that could really make the difference. Now, nobody wants to see people go out of work. I certainly don't. I, I love the fact these narrators exist, but there's another side to this. There are people with hearing problems who may mm. prefer a certain pitch mm. of level. We all have our favorite voices on our screen readers, right? Jacob Ramia, right? We've yep. got our own voices yes. we like. So <laughs> being able to pick that voice and say, hey, do you know what? I want Grace as opposed to whoever it was, Charlie, Charlotte. or whoever it was that was doing it. <laughs> Charlotte, yeah. Um, you know, so I'd, I'd rather pick that voice over the other. Or, you know, one person could choose to listen with one voice, one person with another. It can really increase the choice and the capability of being able to listen and enjoy those books. Yep, I totally agree with that. It's basically like a super, super upgraded ver version of uh, synth audio, right? Like if you can, if I yeah. could have it in the palm of my hands where I can pick up an ebook, but instead of using the synth stuff that I'm used to, really upgrade the performance of uh, the, the screen reader, I guess, um, and use one of these AIs, then I have access to everything. So cool, guys. Well, we're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. This was fun. I know, this was fun. Was uh, Jacob Shemansky and, of course, uh, Ramya Amuthan. I, I got that pronounced. I, it's, what you was did his it. name? I, know, I did it well. Um, where can they find the audiobook review? Oh, uh, we are on podcasts, weekly episodes, new episodes every week. Uh, just search for AMI Audiobook Review. Thank you, both of you, for being with us. When we come back, Ryan Bateman's going to be with us. He's the co-founder of AxCon, a convention that's uh, all about digital accessibility, uh, extremely successful, and he is standing by to tell us all about this year's edition. Stick around. There's more Access Tech Live to come. Get involved and have your say at Access Tech Live on social media. We'll be right back. Now, back to Access Tech Live, the latest in tech and accessibility with Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. Welcome back. This is Access Tech Live. I'm Stephen Scott. Mark Aflalo is with me. We're having a lot of fun this week, and we hope you can get involved as well. Uh, Mark, we're going to shift gears a little bit now and talk about an event that is coming up at the end of this month that everyone can get involved in. That is right. Back in 2021, DQ Systems, which is a web and software services company who focuses on digital inclusion, that created a very cool one-of-a-kind online-only conference all about digital accessibility. Now, AxCon, which is what it's called, returns for its fourth consecutive year. Joining us now is the co-founder and Mark lead at DQ Systems, Ryan Bateman. Ryan, number one, congrats on all your success to date. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We're looking forward to previewing exactly what uh, we're having up in just, what, two weeks now, three weeks? My God. Oh, yeah, it's coming up real quick. Uh, I, I couldn't be more excited. Uh, fe February 20th through 22nd, uh, three-day conference, uh, AxCon, like I said, coming up. Um, great to meet you both, gents. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a three-day conference. Uh, divided into four tracks, uh, really meant to appeal to anyone and everyone that's trying to help further the mission of digital accessibility. It's right? so cool, you know, and, and for people who aren't familiar with it, how, do, how did it come to be? Like, how was it first created? And obviously we know what it's all about, but so, and what kind of programming do people expect? But give us the backstory first. Sure, sure. So, um, it, it, I've I've been uh, at DQ for about six years, and uh, in my time um, in the digital accessibility space here, I was just observing that uh, there is this fantastic and passionate community, right, that is trying to uh, help make the web more digitally equitable. And there were pockets of physical meetups all around the world, uh, across the U.S. There are some fantastic assistive technology shows that are out there where a lot of great magic happens. Um, but there really wasn't a big centralized uh, conference that is especially free and virtual that invites folks from around the world to focus explicitly on digital accessibility and digital accessibility testing, right? So designing digital accessible experiences developing them, reinforcing them, the people and process and culture that it takes, right? For all of us to make sure that we're building accessible experiences together. And that's across the board, right? I mean, we're talking here about 
all disabilities, all people, and making the web, making apps, making games, making everything accessible, right? You got it. If it's digital, it, it should be accessible, right? And and that's for everybody. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the way that we have the, the conference set up today in these different tracks is really meant to help people wherever they are in their digital accessibility journey, whether they're just getting started out um, and trying to make their company's website or mobile apps or video games or uh, digital documentation. They're just trying to make it um, the, the, you know, the, the bare minimum uh, amount of accessible, or they're really trying to innovate, right? And push the envelope uh, with, with the latest trends uh, with regard to making sure that uh, that app is as usable and friendly to everyone as, as humanly possible, right? Um, so yeah, that, that's sort of what the conference is about and who did it for. Anyone can come in. Um, it's you know r really the, the one thing that every AxCon attendee has in common is that they are an advocate and a champion for change and they're trying to do more. And that's what we try to offer in, in, in the talks uh, for, for folks that attend. Brian, what kind of programming, like what kind of specific topics do you have coming up this year? And what are some of the, the companies that get involved every year? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, we've got three stellar keynotes uh, that are lined up. Uh, Ramon Chaudhry, uh, Jonah uh, Berger, and uh, Squirmy and Grubs. Uh, I'm not sure if, if you are familiar with them uh, uh, from YouTube. Uh, check them out if you haven't. Um, but the, the, the theme that we try to reinforce with the keynotes, right, um, is, is generally pretty high level, right? We wanna make sure that people feel empowered, impassioned, and give them some lessons for affecting change, right? Um, so uh, Ramon Chaudhry um, is a responsible AI fellow, uh, Harvard University co-founder co and CEO of, of a nonprofit human intelligence. Um, she's the, the former director of AI ethics at Twitter. And uh, we all know uh, about, uh, well, everyone knows you can't avoid AI anymore and, and, and it is a, a, a potential topic. Um, she's gonna be bringing some really great color surrounding the use of ethical AI, right? Um, at, which is important everywhere, but certainly important in digital accessibility. Um, there's a lot of changes that have been happening in the last few years uh, with uh, different approaches people are trying to take to make their sites and apps uh, as accessible as they can. And some may rely on what, what some would argue are less ethical uses of AI and others more so. So um, how does the average Joe identify, right? Uh, what is ethical? What is unethical? What will help me make my digital content more accessible without sacrificing and, and hurting others, right? Uh, when you're painting a broad brush with AI and automation, it's really easy to do that. So um, Ramon is gonna be fantastic. Um, Jonah comes to us, he's a he's an um, international best-selling author and professor of the Wharton School of, of uh, Marketing. And um, we brought Jonah in uh, a lot uh, uh, for the same reason that we brought in, uh, if you're familiar with Seth Godin uh, last year, who are these fantastic marketing visionaries. What does marketing have to do with digital accessibility? Well, it's it's really about how do I uh, uh, use my powers of persuasion within my organization to affect change, right? Yeah. Digital accessibility is a lot. It can be a lot to take on and you have to get a lot of recruitment and culture change. And so um, really that that's kind of the idea, right? We're trying to go for these visionaries that are gonna help these champions and advocates make change happen and do more. You know, uh, I got to ask you a question before I even move on. What's written on your T-shirt? I notice it says "Friends don't." I can't see all of it. Friends don't let friendship. Uh, friend, friends friends don't, you know. don't let friendship inaccessible. Care. That's awesome. I love it. <laughs> okay, I got to ask you. So, as as one of the, the co-founders, are are you surprised by the growth? Because starting something online is is different than an event where you're getting trying to get people out in person, right? And I think the timing worked out well. You know, 2020, 2021, yeah. people didn't really yeah, want to yeah. leave their house. Yeah, we certainly benefited. I think the timing was right, right? Sort of the the heat of the pandemic, offering a virtual conference, right? Why not go? Uh, I can't do anything else. Um, but uh, it still shocked us. Um, I mean, we we have some sense, 
right? Uh, DQ obviously is in the digital accessibility space. So we have some sense of the, the growth, the growing growth and in interest that we're seeing here. But uh, AxCon still surprised us. Honestly, that first year, I think we were forecasting around 6,000 folks for attendance and 17,000 showed up. Oh, is that it? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and since then, uh, I think I think the record now is uh, 27,000. So, and, and this year for XCon 2024, we're trending to uh, to beat that record. We'll we'll see where we end up, but um, yeah, pretty pretty fantastic. I, I want to ask you. So. It's, it's interesting here because I'm a I'm one of the average Joes, right? In, a, in this respect of you know someone who uses a lot of tech every day, uses accessible software, you know I use a screen reader, all of that stuff. And I think you know one of my fears, and I think a lot of people uh, who are disabled fear that with this rush to AI, there's a sense of either the AI can solve all of our problems with accessibility, or we just gloss over the problems of the past with accessibility and we just move on and we say, okay, well let's focus on this, there are still many gaps at the moment. For example, I can go to some websites and just have difficulty checking out. I can add something to a basket, I get to a checkout, I just can't get any further. And I have to get cited help for that, which is, is useless. I want to do it myself. So I guess what I'm asking you is, is, it, is that addressed at your conference? Is this something else that you focus on to say, let's make sure we fix the problems of the past before we try and reinvent the future? You're absolutely spot on. That's a, that's a core message that I think if you if you throw a dart at the agenda and go to any one talk, that should be clear to you, right? Now there is a there is a, a fine balance, right? Um, if you, for example, uh, only approach digital accessibility from what we'll call a manual testing perspective, right, where uh, you use a subject matter expert to test every piece of content, every piece of code manually that is in production, right? That is a big, expensive, and slow way to practice, practice digital accessibility. And you'll get a lot of pushback from other stakeholders and, and leadership within a business when you do it that way. So you do have to think about what can I intelligently and carefully automate and balance with that need for uh, for manual testing. And so it is, it's absolutely this balancing act um, that I think every single speaker at AxCon understands. Um, not every single uh, attendee understands that, right? So um, yeah, it's absolutely something that we want people walking away with, right? You can't fear automation and AI because if you do and you fight it and you avoid it, uh, there are, there are others who will embrace it and will start to change the culture and start to you know uh, build this idea that it's that it's acceptable and and it's not right it's it's entirely about building a better experience at its core and a one off project and a band aid right to make some lawsuit go away is is a, it, that will fail right it well you're you're kind of alluding. Time. You're kind of alluding there to, to a question I want to ask you about, which is accessible overlays. This is something that comes up time and time again. We're hearing more and more about these. Uh, the disability yeah. community seems to be very keen to push back on them. What's what's your take? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm I have I have an inherent bias take, right? Because I um I work at a company uh that uh encounters uh selling against overlays, right? Um and, and when I say overlays, I think uh, my definition of that is, is the widget, right? That you'll see uh, floating on a site that offers, in many cases, a different and separate experience, right? When you're encountering a website. So if you're encountering a website through an overlay uh, or a widget, uh, it's not the same native experience that everyone else is, is getting, which um, I think is is fundamentally a problem and at odds with the the whole idea of digital equality. Um, and then uh, there's also the issue of uh, you know, especially if you, you might be able to help um, um, uh, comment on this, but are are you taking away choice of of the individual user and how they want to consume that material, right? Uh, when when I get to go to a website, 
I can use whatever browser I want, whatever technologies I want. I'm empowered to decide how to consume that information because I'm not a screen reader user and I'm not reliant on that, that widget or that thing, right? So when you make that, uh, when you make the, the code accessible, right? There's a reason I'm wearing this shirt, right? When you make that the, the code accessible, the core experience accessible, right? You, you are approaching it from a true digital equality standpoint and making it available uh, in the way that it should be for everyone. And Ryan, and that's a topic I'm sure the that's- the same experience. And I'm sure that's a topic that's gonna be coming up a lot, especially during this year's convention. Um, where can people register if they wanna register? And obviously it's a free conference and so nobody has to pay anything. Um, what's the website address? Sure, it's, it's uh, dq.com slash ax hyphen con. That's d-e-q-u-e dot -E com slash A-X-E hyphen C-O-N. Ryan Bateman, thank you so much for taking the time to fill us in. Uh, we're going to have to have you back on and continue the conversation because there are so many things we could talk about. Yeah. Yeah, thanks so much. When we come back, we're going to get to uh, your answers to our question of the day, which is what makes a good audiobook? So do stick around. This is Access Tech Live. There's more Access Tech Live to come. Get involved and have your say at Access Tech Live on social media. We'll be right back. Now, back to Access Tech Live, the latest in tech and accessibility with Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. Yeah, about audiobooks once again, answering, uh, well, getting the answers to uh, the question of the week from you. How you've been sending them in. What makes a good audiobook, Mark? That is the question we've been asking. You know, I've been thinking about this. I suppose it's like, you know, you want a really good thriller. I love a thriller. That's what I want. I want okay. a psychological thriller, something that's really going to grab me, something I can listen to at night and be terrified. You know, I, I, anything that gives me the opportunity not to have to stare at a book and read the pages, I think is a good audiobook <laughs> in, in yeah, my mind. That's it. But uh, other people have different opinions. And let's start with Gregory. Uh, Gregory writes, uh, the narrator has to be good, uh, good pacing, good character voices, clear and concise. Luke Daniels comes to mind. Okay. Oh, names. Yeah, okay. I like it. Uh, Kamal mm -hmm. writes, it's all about the narrator. If the narrator sucks, so will the book. Common theme, yeah, I, I could think. not agree more. Yeah. Patricia writes, it's uh, if it's a fiction, a narrator who can create a visual of the characters. Do you notice a common theme here, Stephen? I'm, I'm, I'm noticing something uh, in common here. Uh, Becky writes, yeah. uh, for me, a human narrator is a must. I don't know after this show if I agree mm -hmm. with that. Um, if, it, if it's a biography, I prefer it being narrated by the author. So Absolutely. Well, that does bring it to life for me. I love that. Yeah. Uh, David makes it right, nice and simple. He writes, celebrity voice. Interesting. <laughs> Um, That's it? Okay. Yeah, when I was looking for samples for the Alice in Wonderland, the, the little quiz, I found a version by Scarlett uh, Johansson. I'm like, well, I probably can't use this one, so let's not. Uh, so no. I opted on. And the last one comes from our good friend Jenny Bovard. I appreciate both human and synthetic speech narration. The latter, I find, forces my imagination to fill in the blanks, which can be enjoyable. A reliable human narrator isn't too nasal. Sorry, not sorry. She writes in brackets. Enunciates and distinguishes between characters well without overdoing it. If I want a theatrical production with sounds of Etc. I'll listen to a podcast or an audio play. Very well said. Very well yeah, said. I think that's that's the bottom line. I think you know it is about the voice, and yes, AI is improving considerably, no doubt at all. But I think we're a long way off being able to listen to a full book of say. I mean, some of these audio books run to like you know, eight hours or even 10, 20 hours. I've had books, so you know it can be the case that sometimes you think, yeah, you know, maybe not AI. The human voice can add a lot, but you know what? It is getting better all the time. It is definitely getting better. Uh, I want to thank, obviously, Ramya and Jacob for joining us today. And, of course, Brian Bateman, AxCon, uh, a couple weeks. We're going to Vienna a couple weeks. We'll talk about that soon. Thanks to everybody here at AMI in the studios who rushed to get this set going for my little appearance here this morning. That's it. Just all the work that goes into one single day like this is uh, not, uh, not overlooked. Yeah, so I do appreciate that. Um, and, and thank you at home for getting involved. If you want to answer the question now, you can still do that. What makes a good audiobook? Let us know, and uh, maybe we'll talk about it next week as well. Stephen, thank you for being in Glasgow. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. <laughs> and on behalf of everybody on this week's show and Stephen Scott in Glasgow, I am Marco Flalo. Thank you for being with us this week and of course every week here on Access Tech Live. We'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning in to Access Tech Live. Follow us online on all social media at Access Tech Live. Email us feedback at accesstechlive.com.
Hosted by Stephen Scott in Glasgow and Mark Aflalo in Montreal. Written by Stephen Scott and Mark Aflalo. Producer, Mark Aflalo. Live show director, Anastasia Spalding Stenhouse. Technical director, Caitlin Robinson. Audio, Jordan Mulgrave. Live graphics and playback, Kingsley Juco. Graphics coordinator, Eliza Rocco. Integrated described video specialist, M. Williams. Supervising producer, Michelle Dudas. Produced in collaboration with Aflalo Communications, Inc. and Double Tap Productions. Copyright 2024, Accessible Media, Inc. NEMI Original Production.